Uh, thanks, Michelle. And uh, yeah, it's a really great honour to come down and uh, talk to the people who actually make this research possible. Um, so I'm pleased to say that we, we've got some nice results to show you, but essentially the, the whole premise of the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre is that it starts and ends with the uh, discovery cohort, so with you guys. So right from the clinical visits with, with Michelle and the other clinicians through to um, what I'm going to talk about today, which is using the stem cell drive neurons to try and find um, new disease mechanisms and also new drug treatments potentially for Parkinson's which we can then translate into our animal models in Richard's lab and then ultimately translate those therapies back to you guys. And so the question is, is, is how can the skin biopsies that, that you guys so, so generously provided us, um, how can they help, help us understand Parkinson's disease and ultimately find new treatments? So we can make these skin cells um, into stem cells and the stem cells themselves they have the potential to make any cell in the body. So every cell in your body at some point has come from a stem cell, and that includes the skin. And we thought for years that this was a one-way street until uh, two scientists, uh, John Gurdon and uh, Shinji Yam Yamanaka, uh, discovered in 2006, and relatively recently, that we can actually take these skin cells and make them back into um, stem cells. And we call this induced pluripotent stem cells because they're a particular flavor. So what's really important is, is these skin biopsies you take us, that you give to us, we can then take into the lab, reprogram them into these stem cells, and from then, from then we can take these stem cells and make them into any cell type we like. This is really important because um, we obviously can't have ready access to the dopamine neurons which are particularly affected in, uh, affected, affected in Parkinson's disease. Um, so actually kind of what this gives us is a really good insight into what is going on in the earliest stages of Parkinson's. So it's part of the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre, the Discovery Cohort, and along with a European uh, EU-funded project, STEM Bank. What we did uh, in collaboration, um, and this was a lot of work by Sally Cowley, who, who's based in Oxford, is we took um, around uh, 150 Parkinson's patients in, in people without Parkinson's, and we reprogrammed them um, into these uh, stem cells. And that means that we can take these stem cells, we can differentiate them into the dopamine cells which are infected in Parkinson's disease, but we can also differentiate them into other cell types. And the purpose of the EU consortium, which helped fund this, was to do a range of, uh, to reprogram a range of diseases of which Parkinson's was the largest, um, largest disease. So that was really due thanks to the uh, discovery cohort. So just to show you what we do is, we, is, is Michelle, or kind of one of the research nurses, takes a skin biopsy, which, uh, which, which I gather is actually rather painful, but, but, but kind of bearable. Um, and what we're allowed to do is, you know, is, is take these skin cells, we can grow them in the lab, make lots of these skin cells, and then ultimately reprogram them into the stem cells. Once we've got these stem cells, they come into uh, our lab uh, with uh, Professor Witch Ray Martins. And what we do is we specialize in taking these stem cells and differentiating them, so making them into these dopamine neurons which are particularly affected in Parkinson's. And we can use those, as I said, to, to understand the earliest uh, things that, that change in Parkinson's disease and also try and find drugs which will alleviate those, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So just to show you some pictures, and this kind of grainy picture is a lot, a lot of skin cells. So this, if you take a, punch, a skin punch from someone, then you see all of these skin cells packed in together. We can then start letting them grow out and we can start turning them into stem cells. So the skin cells are up here, and from out here we can grow out the stem cells. And then we have our stem, cell, stem cells here, and we can start making them into the dopamine neurons that we're interested in. And so this process takes around 30 days or 60 days, uh, depending on kind of what, what sort of neurons we want to look at. And we have our mass of stem cells here. And just uh, from, from out of them, this is day eight, we can start to see stem cell, the, the uh, neurons started to grow out from the stem cell colony. Eventually here, this is 20 days after we start the process, um, we can see kind of the, just these little tiny neurons, neuronal cells coming out. If we image them another 10 days after that, so in the presence of uh, lots of chemicals which we know kind of are important in the development of the brain, then we can start forming these really nice long processes here from these cells, and that's very indicative of, of neurons in the brain. If we stain these, we can get very pretty pictures, and we can see that kind of these red cells are neurons, and the, the green cells are, are dopamine neurons. So we can see kind of we, we get quite a lot of dopamine neurons in these cultures, um, and we can use those to really understand the disease. 
If we take them a bit longer, then we find actually they, the, these cells start to clump and almost make um, uh, uh, these kind of clumps which are very reminiscent of kind of, um, of kind of little tiny brains, or they're not tiny brains, but they're very reminiscent. Um, and we can find that actually if we zoom out, then we can see that all of these connect to each other, much like kind of uh, sections of the brain. And so this is really interesting. We can make these, uh, we can make these cells, um, uh, which kind of we wouldn't otherwise have access to, and really gives us an insight into the earliest phases of Parkinson's disease. So what have we used these for? And so we've uncovered some really interesting biology that goes on in these dopamine cells. Um, for example, we know that proteins in the cell under normal uh, proteins in the cell are made by this uh, organelle, the endoplasmic reticulum. It makes the proteins, and then the proteins carry out their function. Eventually, over time, they get damaged, and they're removed by this protest, process called autophagy, um, by this kind of, um, these organelles, the autophagosome and lysosome, and essentially we end up uh, recycling these proteins so that the cell can reuse them. What we found in some of the Parkinson's disease cells is actually this endoplasmic reticulum, which is very dependent on the use of uh, calcium, we find that it's actually relatively poorly able to release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, which causes uh, 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 improper folding of the proteins and increased protein damage. We also know calcium is very important for this last stage, so very important for the recycling of these damaged proteins, and we know calcium plays a role here. And just to show you kind of uh, one thing that kind of obviously that this is kind of you have to take my word for it, but one thing that really shows that this is all true is one of the researchers in our lab uh, made a cake to, um, to uh, this is a dopamine neuron here, so this is a cell body, this is the axon here. Um, we can see the ER here, which is uh, important for handling the calcium, and we can also see kind of uh, the green, um, some would say they're Smarties, but that's clearly an autophagosome here, this is a lysosome here, and they fuse together to recycle the damaged proteins. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. Um, and to show you kind of some of the data that we, we found, if, if we take, take um, cells derived from people without Parkinson's and people with Parkinson's, then what we find is that the ability to release calcium um, uh, in these Parkinson's, cells from Parkinson's, um, people with Parkinson's, um, is actually decreased. Um, and so what we're really interested in is finding kind of uh, drugs and therapies that will increase this back. We think this is a really important process in these cells. We know it's involved in uh, the development of Parkinson's, so what we're interested in is correcting this. And I think really the take-home message that I, I want everyone to, 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 to know is that we can only find these new aspects of Parkinson's disease because we use the stem cells derived from Parkinson's patients. We know that these processes are important, but we don't know whether we should be increasing the amount of calcium or decreasing the, the amount of calcium. But actually, because we have the stem cells from you guys, people with Parkinson's, then we're actually able to say, we know that we want to increase the release of calcium in these cells. And so that's here. So can we use these cells to find new treatments for Parkinson's by increasing the ability of these cells to release calcium? So how are we going to do this? We, we've got the cells. We know what the problem is. How can we correct it? And it's very much like looking for your keys um, on, on a drunken night out. Um, you can either look straight under the, the, the lamppost. So we can look for drugs with existing evidence. We can look for drugs that work in other diseases. So uh, many of you maybe have heard of repositionable drugs. So maybe those drugs which uh, work on other diseases to affect calcium, maybe we can look at some of those. But we can also go and just try and find a brand new drug. And so before, what we would do is we would take one of these hypotheses and we would test a small number of drugs. So what we would do, and maybe there's some plates going around in the audience uh, to, to, to illustrate this point, but what we would usually do is we'd usually use these large six-well plates um, and we would test the effect of six drugs, which would allow us maybe six existing drugs or maybe kind of six <coughs> brand new drugs. But what we're able to do now with, with, with some of the technology, which I'm going to show you briefly in a second, is we're able to make this, miniaturize this into, the, into much smaller formats. So rather than testing six drugs, we're now able to test 384 drugs at a time. And this is really important. Um, it, it gets the best use out of the material that we're providing. It gets the best use out of the funds that we have to do this research. And it's carried out a lot, a lot by kind of with the aid of robots. And so this is one of our cell feeding robots here. So we have one of our three, we have three of our three, eight, four well plates here. They contain the uh, differentiated stem cells. And what this robot's doing at the moment is it's uh, putting some drugs, um, it's putting 384 drugs onto each of these 
and so we can test the effects of these 384 drugs at once on these cells. And as I showed you before, what we want, so this is just a picture of some of these cells um, in, in one of these uh, very tiny wells. Um, and what we're able to do, as I said before, is we're trying to correct this, uh, this inability or decreased ability to release calcium from the ER. And so we do that, and uh, at the moment, um, this is some of the data that we had before. We've now tested 4,500 different compounds, um, so 4,500 potential therapies for Parkinson's disease, and we've looked at their ability to release calcium. And what we found here, and you see kind of, uh, this is a graph, and this is basically the ability to re release, release calcium, and the more re we release calcium, the more we think we're, um, we're uh, correcting um, what's wrong in Parkinson's. And so we've got a whole host of drugs here, which are able to increase calcium release. So we think these are good potential drugs. Um, and th there's probably out of the 4,500, and I think there's probably about 300 drugs which initially do this. We then really want to be sure before we invest lots and lots of time and money in, in, in characterizing these drugs, um, is we really want to know they're working. And so if the drug is actually really having an effect, we know that if we have less drug, we'll have less of an effect. And so what we've got here, we've got a graph which shows less drug down here and more drug up here. And we can see this drug, which is this is drug which looks really interesting and really um, promising, is when we add more of the drug, we correct more of the phenotype. So we're able to increase this ability of the cells to release calcium. And so with more drug, we're able to do that. And so this is one of our uh, many drugs, and I think we probably have around uh, uh, 50 drugs which kind of pass this test that we're really interested in, we're really hopeful to see um, what else they do in cells. So what are we doing now? We're trying to confirm that these really do increase the calcium release, as I just showed you. We're trying to look at the structure of these drugs and can we make them better? Can we make more of these drugs get to the brain where we actually need them to work? Um, does increasing this calcium release help with other problems in the cell? We've just heard about alpha-synuclein and how alpha-synuclein aggregates. Does it stop alpha-synuclein from aggregating? Does it re reduce the amount of alpha-synuclein aggregating? And we can work, um, and we do work with Laura to assess kind of whether actually these drugs will have an effect on that. And then eventually, kind of, if it passes all these tests, does the drug cure an animal model of Parkinson's disease? It's about the, as good as we can before we start uh, recruiting Parkinson's patients. So with some of our animal models, which I've not talked about today, but no doubt many of you have heard about, can we use these drugs to cure an animal model of Parkinson's disease? And so really it starts with, the, with, with kind of uh, you guys giving up your time for the in-depth clinical analysis, which really allows us to kind of understand what we see in the dis dish and contextualize it. Um, and then ultimately, we take them into the lab, we're hopefully finding new therapies, we've got some very promising stuff coming through, um, and hopefully we can translate that back um, in a couple of years' time to, um, to, to um, the Discovery Cohort. And on that note, I just want to thank the OPDC Discovery Cohort in, uh, in um, uh, us in the lab, try and get out as much as we can in, in uh, participate in uh, Sally Bromley's uh, very... Uh, very good at getting us along to the, to the walks and the runs, and we're, we're very appreciative of being able to integrate with you, you guys in the community. Um, so it reminds me to thank kind of the people that have done a lot of the work. Um, so uh, there's a number of people who are on this list and not on this list that work in Richard's lab, as well as people in Oxford, um, so Sally Cowley and Jane Viles, who did a huge amount of the um, reprogramming, and obviously the clinical team for providing the, um, the cells. So I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you.